Hey everybody, welcome back to another uh, in my series of creating a great tone for our Align 6 Helix. Today I wanted to talk about a topic that I get a lot of questions about. Another topic I probably should have discussed before now, it's about the elusive gain staging you hear so many folks talk about. Now this is a topic full of all sorts of misinformation and myths I've seen thrown around, a lot of questions, and I wanted to clear up some things and sort of give one definitive video where we can understand what gain staging is. So let's talk about it. So what is a gain stage? Well, a gain stage is a point within an audio signal path that the engineer or sound creator has the ability to raise or lower the gain or the volume at that particular point. Now you might say, okay, big deal. You take a, 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 a simple human Helix preset and you have an amplifier and you have maybe a distortion pedal before it and you have a, a delay after it and a reverb after that and a compressor. At each of those places, there's the ability to raise or lower the volume. Now what's going to happen is that's going to dramatically affect the signal going into the next piece of the signal chain. Now that may or may not matter depending on what we're dealing with and we're going to look at some examples today of where it will matter and where it won't matter, okay? So that it's very interesting stuff and very important to getting the most out of your helix and your presets and signal chains essentially. So why does it matter? Well, two things. The, our main goals with gain staging is to do two things in my opinion or the two most important things, let's say, because there are other things. It's to get the best signal to noise ratio out of whatever device we're dealing with or devices we're dealing with. And it's also to avoid unwanted distortion, especially working in the digital realm. There's nothing worse than digital distortion. This is not like working back in the days with tape in the studio where we wanted to push the tape hard to get tape saturation, sort of non-linear tape saturation to add a sweetness to whatever we were recording. This is very different. Digital distortion is either on or off and it's bad when it's on. So, you know, proper gain staging will help us to get the most out of our equipment. Now I mentioned something called signal to noise ratio and a lot of folks may or may not know what that means. Let me give a quick explanation. Let's use the previous example of recording to tape. Let's say that tape, when we're just running it with no signal on it, has an inherent noise to it. And a lot of different audio devices have this. In fact, all different audio devices have this. In the digital age, it's not such a problem. Most of the devices are so quiet that it's really become almost a non-issue to worry about the noise floor. But let's go back to something like tape. And I'll just use a sort of a physical uh, visual examples here. Let's say we had that much noise floor on the tape that we, you know, we have no way of getting rid of. Well, if we only record our signal, you know, one dB, above that, well, we've got a problem. We're gonna hear the noise almost just as much as we hear the signal we're recording. So our signal to noise ratio is very, very bad. If we record the signal up here, numerous dB, maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 dB above the noise floor, now the noise is almost going to be inaudible because it's drowned out by our signal that we want to be heard. So that would be a much better signal to noise ratio. I hope that's a very simple, easy discussion. So the idea is we always want to have the strongest, hottest possible signal coming out of whatever device we're using up until the point of getting something we don't want. And in this case, I'm talking about distortion. So if we record into our DAW so loud that we're clipping, well, we've ruined our recording. So we didn't gain stage properly. We have too much output coming out of the entire signal chain. You know, where in the signal chain do we have to adjust that? Well, that depends on the signal chain itself. So I hope that's clear. Now there is another time where gain staging is important and I'll use the example of a guitar. Really, in, as a guitar player, the first gain stage in anything we do is our guitar itself. We can turn our volume up, we can turn our volume down. If this is on zero, we get no sound. So improperly gain staged, right? If we turn it up to 10, we get our strongest signal and guitar players are notorious for using the volume control to even maybe lessen the amount of overdrive on an amp. So that's interesting. If we're feeding a signal from one piece of the signal chain, whether it's guitar or another effects module, into a distortion effect or an amplifier that we're getting distortion from, the amount of signal we hit it with is going to affect the amount of distortion we get. So would it not then be logical to think that the amount of signal I have output from the previous part of the signal chain into the distortion effect is very important. Uh, you know, if we, if we dial in a perfect tone with the perfect amount of distortion, then we go hit the front end harder after the fact, 
we've changed our tone completely. That's part of gain staging. So really, you know, the amount of distortion we're gonna get out of it, possibly good distortion in that case, uh, avoiding bad distortion in the case of clipping in, in the digital realm, and maximizing signal to noise ratio is going to be very, very important. Take an example such as the Line 6 Power Cab. If you go to the manual, you, it will tell you in there that the best response the Power Cab gives you is when the little LED on that is in the yellow. The speakers react more realistic to how they designed them. So on the Power Cab, we have a green light, a yellow light, a red light. A red light is into dangerously close or into clipping, right? The yellow light is sort of the nominal place we want it to be, and green is showing we're getting signal, but maybe not as much as we want. I've had a lot of people tell me with the power cab, you know, the power cab's not loud enough, and they crank it up, and they're just not getting enough signal. Well, chances are they're not sending enough signal into it in the first place. So if our Helix preset is too quiet, we're not maximizing the signal to noise ratio within our power cab, right? Which is very, can really make or break whether we even want to use the power cab. We think there's not enough volume there right? It's not sounding the way we want it to. So the best thing to do would be to maximize in that particular case, make sure the output of our, of our helix uh, is sending enough output so that we uh, are hitting the power cab with the signal it wants to be hit with. And I recently did a video about setting line or instrument and, you know, set up to the right output as well. In this case with the power cab, a line output would be very important on the Helix as well. Now, there's a little bit of misinformation and some questions I've been getting lately about what output level our presets should have. Well, I want to go over to Cubase and HX Edit now to dispel some myths and rumors using an interesting thing called a null test. So come with me over there. Okay, so here we are over in Cubase. Now, I don't know if many of you are aware of what a null test is. Basically, in a nutshell, we can use a null test to compare two audio files to see if they are identical or extremely close to the point where they're not even audibly different, which matters, right? If the differences are so low down underneath the main signal, then it's, the, it's not even going to be audible if there are differences. But let's take a look at this. And to show you how we do a proper null test, I've set up an interesting Helix preset here. I have two paths, identical, both set to multi-ins, which I'm hooked in with my guitar. So they're going to get the guitar ins. I could set them to guitar and it doesn't matter as long as everything's the same. There's nothing on the signal path except at the end, I'm going out of USB 1, 2 on one path and USB 3, 4 on the other path. So I'm essentially going to Cubase here um, and recording to two different tracks. One of these is going to be coming from uh, stereo in two and one is gonna be coming from stereo in one as you can see over here. So one is going to be set and I can show you how I have that set up over here. Stereo in one is input one and two, stereo in two is input three and four. So this one will be getting the top path, this track will be getting the bottom path. Now, just to show you how a null test works, we'll do this. I'm going to record my guitar playing whatever, doesn't matter, and it's going to record the first one through this path, the second one through this path. Okay, let's do that just to start off with. Now, if you noticed, we had monitoring just one of the tracks. I have my guitar peaking about minus 9.4. I was putting, hitting pretty hard. But my average volume level, or sort of almost my perceived loudness, is going to be more in the minus 28 region, meaning this is a very low level signal. We're going to want more signal than this to come out of the helix to maximize our potential signal to noise ratio, depending on where our destination is going to be. But now the interesting thing about this, let me set this up so that I just loop uh, this. Okay, now when I play this back, let me get off the uh, monitoring here. Um, you're going to hear both of these uh, play. You can see here that both tracks are set with no other processing. Everything's bypassed, zero dB on both. Now, if I go up to my phase button and flip the phase on one of these, you will see that the sound will disappear because these two tracks are identical. Let's try this. 
And you'll now see that the meter just fades away down to nothing and it takes a second to do so, but we're down to this infinity level. This is nulled perfectly. That means that what I recorded on one path is identical to what I put on the other path, okay? This is not a surprise. I mean, this is how it should work. If I flip this phase again, I cancel it out by putting the phase on. I get my signal back when putting the phase off. That's fine. That's exactly as we would expect it. So I can get rid of those two. Now, what happens, and there's this misconception that I've been asked about a lot, that if we boost the volume internally of the helix to get a higher output, that somehow that's gonna change the tone. Now, there's a couple of ways we can boost it. Let's go to one path here. And what did we have here? Uh, I said we had about on the peak level. And when we, let's go back to the peak level for a second. When we talk about peak, um, what we're going to notice is the peak is basically not going to give us much information other than that's the loudest this signal ever got to. That's how much headroom we have before we reach possible distortion, right? Especially when we're dealing with digital, right? We, have, we don't want to surpass that 0 dB where we get into the digital distortion, right? 0 dB FS, full scale. Um, so I think it was about 9. So we could come over here and I'm going to do something interesting. I'm going to put a gain block on over here. I'll just make it a stereo game block since we're recording stereo tracks. Okay. And I'm going to boost that up by, let's do 8 dB. So now this path's going to be 8 dB louder. Okay. So we'll do the same little experiment. I will record this again. Okay. So now obviously one is much louder. And if we look, we're dangerously close to possibly peaking. You can see these peaks going way up there. So maybe I even got close on the digital distortion. But let's now loop this again so that we hear both. Now, we're going to obviously, I'll pull up my mixer here. I'm gonna take the phase away. Now, what did we say we did? We boosted it by 8 dB. So if I bring that down by 8 dB, the louder of the two, which is track two, I'm going to reduce that by 8 dB within Cubase. Let's play that. Once again, when I flip the phase on it, this disappears, the sound disappears. Now, the one thing you're hearing is a little tiny click, and that's because it did get some distortion, which is not on the other track. So let's do this. Let's just find where that distortion is and take that out of the equation. Very interesting stuff here. So we'll loop this much of it. And now you will see minus infinity. They're, these are identical. So this is very interesting. And this debunks a bit of a myth that if we somehow boost the signal within the helix path, that it's going to change the sound of our preset. It is not. The Helix is simply an audio interface. If we're not doing any sort of non-linear type of modeling like within the amps and whatnot, uh, when we're dealing with strict boosting and cutting of volumes or a signal, you know, the idea of a preset being too loud, it's only too loud if it's causing us a problem at our destination, right? It's not, if, it, if we're sending it to a power cab and we're clipping the power cab, then we've got a problem. We've got to bring it the level back. But if we're sitting at the nominal level on the power cab, then it doesn't matter how loud we're coming out of here. In fact, we want to come out of the helix at the loudest possible volume to maximize our signal to noise ratio. Let's do one other test. Let's get rid of that and let's boost it on the output. Let's go up, let's say 5 dB this time, just so we don't run into that clipping problem again. So now the second path is going to be 5 dB. Sorry, I'll just get rid of that. 5 dB louder than the previous path, but this time boosted on the output. Okay, so let's try this. Okay, and again, I'm just gonna set my, my locators here, have that loop. All right, I still have my phase on here. Now, we dropped that by 5 dB, so if I come over here in Cubase, Drop that by 5 dB, flip the phase. Once again, 
it disappears. That means those two are identical, okay? So that's showing us that the helix is doing exactly, exactly what it should be doing with no questions asked, okay? So this is great news. Now, where it gets interesting though, is if I come back and I set these all the same, is a question I get a lot about using channel volume. And let's do this. Let's pick an amp and a cab. We'll go to, let's say, the Brit Plexi Norm, and I'm just going to copy that paste it down here so we have, again, identical paths. Now, I wanna record the same sort of idea here and let's see if they null the same way that they nulled without processing on, okay? There's something gonna, very interesting gonna happen here, so let's try this. Okay, we'll go back and we will loop these again. Now, when we play them separate, we hear what we hear, both of them combined. Now I'm gonna flip the phase and you're gonna see something interesting. Do you hear how it doesn't null perfectly? On the peak meters, it's floating up around minus 50.3. Over here though, if we, if we reset this, we get minus 50.3 on the peak, but the, the, the average volume of it is down around minus 66. Now this is interesting. You might say, well, why don't they null? Well, I'm guessing, I'm gonna check with my friend Eric over at Line 6, but I kind of chalk this up more to the idea of there's some sort of non-linear uh, distortion characteristics within the modeling of the amp model uh, so that, you know, even though we're playing the same signal, it's going through two different amps and they're reacting slightly different, kind of like two different tube amps would. So, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm right, but it was very interesting. But anyways, let's keep that as a baseline. We know we're somewhere around minus 70 dB under. Now, this is the reason why I wanted to do that, is because I've heard a lot of folks say, if we use the channel volume instead, we see they're both at 5.5. Well, what happens if I take one of these, uh, let's do this one, up to 10, let's say, and this one down to two. Now, there's no necessarily really real way of knowing how many decibels we're dealing with here, because this isn't measured in decibels, but I'm gonna record these two. Now, um, let me make sure that this isn't going to clip, first of all, on uh, my track. No, we're still going to be good with that. Um, so I'm going to record these two now. Guitar 2 is going to be much louder, so these won't null, but we'll see if we can get them to null to that same sort of ballpark of minus 70, which would prove that using the channel volume to boost or lower doesn't change the sound of the preset. It's only going to raise or lower the volume. Let's give this a try. Okay, now we can really see a huge difference here, right? Um, this first one, if I just play this back, and I'll loop that. Super, super, super quiet, right? The second one. Okay, so can we get these to null to the same degree that they were nulling before? Well, let's see if we can. We have them both playing. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to boost the really low one by 6.02 to be the max it can go. I'm gonna flip the phase here, and I'm gonna lower this until we get that down where we're really not hearing much of anything anymore. You notice here now, I've actually nulled this even better down to minus 103. Uh, if I come back over here and unflip this. We get our sound back, okay? Isn't that interesting? So what does this prove? Well, it proves that by playing, making a preset that's let's say louder than another preset by using just simple uh, you know, gain blocks or output blocks, raising and lowering is not changing the sound of the preset in any way, shape or form. 
Using the channel volume on an amp model does not change the tone at all. You can crank this up to 10 if you want. It's not going to affect the sound of your preset, as long as you're not distorting something in the path after, if that makes sense. So I hope that helps to straighten up a few myths and misconceptions about how this side of things work. Now let's go talk a little bit more about gain staging. Okay, so now that we understand that within the Helix, bo simply boosting or lowering the volume of a simple signal chain is not going to make a preset better or worse. We understand that scientifically now. It's basically been proven and debunked uh, just because I've got so many questions about that recently about about you know, how loud the preset should be. And the, the only proper answer for that is as loud as you can get it without uh, having negative effect on your uh, final outcome. If you're going to a power cap, we don't want the power cap to clip. But if our signal is too low coming out of the helix, we have to crank the power cap up, its noise floor comes up, it's not, and we won't get much volume out of it. So really bad practice to do it that way. Um, so really we want that Helix preset to be as loud as possible. Now, if we're working with a DAW, then we don't want to clip beyond zero dB. So watch that your preset gain staging final output is not going to get you negative effects on your destination, if that makes sense. All right. So hopefully that's cleared up. Now let's take a look at a, a typical kind of setup. So we have a blank path. I have my first gain stage. I'm going to talk about always having our guitar volume on 10 for using this. Now let's say that I set up a simple amp and cab. And I'll go back over here. What was I using in the other example? Brit Plexi Norm. Okay. So we have sound coming out of this now. Regardless of, I'm not going to dial anything in particularly. Now, you know, a talk, common thing maybe to do would be to, to, to throw a delay on it after, maybe a, a reverb on here as well. So now I have different stages of gain. If you look, as we've just discussed, the output, the final output that's not going to affect the tone is the channel volume. If we're on zero, we get nothing. If we're on 10, as I've already proven, we just get louder with no effect on the tone whatsoever, okay? Now, if we were to use the master control, that's going to change things because that's going to lessen the amount of power tube distortion. Not so much with the channel volume. It's just going to raise and lower the volume, okay? So now we're feeding that, and I am going out of this as loud as I can, I'm feeding into the delay. Delays and reverbs tend to handle, within the helix, whatever output we can put into them quite easily. Now, if I was to do something silly like you know, have a compressor at the beginning, let's say, a deluxe comp, and, you know, crank this up 36 dB, right? And then say, well, ooh, that's, that's really hitting everything very hard. And then take my channel volume and bring this down to compensate. Now my tone has changed. I'm getting more distortion out of the amp. and listen to all the noise I'm getting as well, right? Whereas if I get rid of this, crank this to 10, do you see how the noise floor went down and the uh, signal to noise ratio went way up? That's a good example of a really poor practice. So I cranked up, you know, one stage of gain, had to compensate by bringing the other stage way down, usually something wonky is gonna go on with your signal to noise ratio. But in the normal case like this, whether I have my channel volume up or down, I'm still gonna get my reverb and delay functioning properly. If you notice that you're clipping your delay or you're clipping your reverb, well, whatever stage is causing that before it, you need to come in and you need to adjust that, it's that simple. But delays and reverbs are really not going to be terribly affected usually uh, by how much signal we send into them, unless again, we put them over the point where they're clipping. But within the Helix, I've yet to do that. I haven't really had a problem. I guess it's possible, depending on how you have your other gain stages set up, okay? So anything feeding into this amp, the harder we hit it, the more or the less it's going to distort, right? If we hit it very quietly. You know, also if I came in with the deluxe comp.
we hear our distortion go away now because I'm taking input away from it. That's, a, that's akin to, to rolling our volume level back, right? So you see how important it is before and after distortion effects. Now, what's interesting here is if I clean this up and I put a distortion pedal of some sort, let's go with the air apparent and we'll get some. Fairly clean without it, this adds distortion. Now if I hit the front end of that harder, obviously not, way to, not a good way to do it as it boosts the noise, but it also boosts the amount of distortion. So one good rule is with gain staging, if you're feeding into an amplifier or a distortion effect, that is going to add to the distortion, the more signal we gain stage into that effect, the more overdrive we're getting. So if we have a preset made with the right amount of distortion, if we put something before it that boosts the input going into that effect, we're likely going to raise the distortion as well. Uh, I guess that's to be said for a lot of different effects as well, even if we went into a tube compressor, let's say, but usually that amount of distortion is gonna be much less. But I'm glad we mentioned compression because if I throw, like I love to do, an LA Studio Comp at the end. Now, keep in mind, I'll set this so that I get, you know, a lot of times in and around these settings where I'll get maybe uh, one or two dB of, of gain reduction. Well, compressors are interesting because the more gain we hit into the front of it again, then the more peak reduction we're gonna get because it it's, has a certain threshold set that's now being surpassed, right? So if I go here and set my compressor at the end for a couple dB of gain reduction and then come in here and either lower the channel volume or raise the channel volume, that is going to affect the amount of compression we get. Maybe to the point where you take all the compression away. Maybe to the point where you add too much. Also, if you came into something like the reverb or the delay and went to their level controls and boosted or cut, it's going to affect that as well, if that makes any sense. So is that all clear? I think I covered what I wanted to cover there. Um, you just want to be really mindful. And I guess the rule of thumb to follow would be knowing that whatever you send from one stage into the next stage will affect the stage towards the end, right? In some effects, it doesn't matter as much, such as reverbs and delays, possibly, until we're maybe clipping them. In others, such as distortion effects, amplifiers, compressors, it does matter because we're actually gonna alter the tone. But another great takeaway here is, we now know that we can go about boosting the level of our signal, either at the output block, with the channel volume, uh, with a gain block, it's not going to change the tone. It's only going to affect what comes after that point in the signal chain. So this brings up another very important point. A lot of folks say, well, what if I'm happy with my preset? I love the amount of distortion. I love the amount of compression. I love everything about it, How, but it's too quiet. How do I make it louder? My answer is almost always go to the output block. They give us at the end here, 20 dB of extra gain in the helix. So let's say that uh, we're playing and we're going, okay, uh, I'm, I'm recording in my DAW and I'm only, my peaks are up around minus 10. Well, I've got a lot of headroom. That means my average volume is probably way lower than that. So I'm gonna probably come in here and say, if I, my peaks are at minus 10, I could probably bring this up, 8 dB brings my average volume level up, okay? Hasn't affected the tone at all. It brings my peaks up to a, to a point where I still have a couple dB of headroom, or, or you go a little bit less than that, leave yourself a little more headroom, maybe only go up six. So a lot of times I'll try to leave four dB of headroom, you know, whatever it works, right? And then we're going to be getting the best signal to noise ratio. In the case of mixing in a DAW, we're also not gonna run out of volume where we've cranked the channel up and we still need it louder and we have to go out. So gain staging is important in the instance of going to something like the power cab, right? If we've done our, our whole path and everything's perfect, we don't wanna mess with it, but we're still only in the green and we wanna be in the yellow, we come over here and we boost that up until we get in the yellow, which is maximizing the signal to noise ratio and also the power uh, volume output ability of the, of the power cab as well. And this goes for other FRFRs, whether they have lights or not, you know, we can use our ears more in that. So 
I, I hope that was helpful, guys. And I just really felt it was important. I've been getting so many questions lately about this volume, how loud should a preset be? How should I boost it? How should I cut it? And I want to take a very scientific approach to talking about the best methods uh, to get this done. So I hope that answers some of your questions about gain staging and I really hope it helps you to get the most out of your presets in, in a way that's gonna work for you. So thanks so much for tuning in. Please like the video, share it if you don't mind, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Really appreciate your support guys and I will be back very soon with some more content. Ciao for now.